So, a hush falls upon the room very naturally. Uh, dear fellows and friends, welcome to the Royal Academy of Engineering for this special event, the 40th anniversary of our first regular Academy event, the Hinton Lecture. The lecture was first hosted only five years after the Fellowship of Engineering was formed in 1976 with uh, 130 fellows and is named after its first president, the energy industry leader, Lord Hinton of Bankside. Lord Hinton pioneered the development of nuclear power in the UK. And if he was here now, I think he would be intrigued to see that in the UK at least, the technology did not advance in the way that was expected and that we are still concerned yet about power supply four decades later. He would, however, be excited by the advances that have been made recently towards generating power from nuclear fusion. The work at the Joint European Taurus is impressive and shows real promise for the long term. Over the years, the Hinton Lecture became a showcase for discussion of the biggest and most important engineering projects in the world and a forum to debate how engineering is addressing society's most intractable challenges. Hinton lecturers have ranged from the chairman of Crossrail to the project manager for the Large Hadron Collider. Most recently, before the pandemic, we heard from Dame Steve Shirley how she founded a world-beating computer software company on her kitchen table, and John G. and Andrea about his role shaping machine learning and AI strategy at Apple. Tonight's Hinton Lecture does reflect on engineering's contribution to society's challenges, but also looks to the future. We are here to be inspired by the next generation and the vision of one particular young innovator. Time Magazine's first ever Kid of the Year, Gitanjali Rao. Gitanjali is joining us live from the US where she has already achieved so much. She was named America's top young scientist and received an EPA presidential award for her device Tethys, designed to detect lead pollution in drinking water. And she's also developed a device to diagnose prescription opioid addiction and an anti-cyberbullying app that uses AI and natural language processing. She was honored in Forbes magazine's 30 Under 30 in Science in 2019 and as Time's top young innovator. Her STEM workshops have inspired over 50,000 students in the last two years across five continents and 26 countries. Indeed, only yesterday she gave a webinar to our own schools across the UK as part of the 10th anniversary programme for our Connecting STEM Teachers Network. We were delighted to meet Gitanjali first in 2019 when she travelled to London to open our Global Grand Challenges Summit, a joint venture between the US, the UK and Chinese National Academies of Engineering. Since then, we have obviously had a global pandemic and the impact of global climate change has become even more immediate. So, Gitanjali, you are very welcome indeed, and we are keen to hear from you again now at this critical time. So what is your message for the engineering community, and most importantly, your own generation of students, and what more can we do to encourage young people to join the engineering profession to help create a sustainable and inclusive society? I'm delighted now to invite Gitanjali to give this year's lecture, and please welcome her to the virtual stage. First of all, thank you so much for that fantastic introduction. And it is, I'm so incredibly excited to be here and hopefully share a little bit of my story with all of you today. But first of all, I wanna start out with a huge hello to everyone. It's so fantastic to be here and thank you for having me and I hope that all of you are doing well. Let me start this off with a few small stories. One of the biggest contributing factors for child mortality in rural Africa is pneumonia particularly the delay in diagnosis due to expensive equipment required. But Ugandan inventor Brian Turbagie created a relatively inexpensive biomedical smart jacket called Mama Ope, or Mother's Hope, that uses sound patterns from the lungs, your temperature, and your breathing rate to diagnose the condition within four minutes without needing a doctor or a physician as well. Now, that's just one example. I'm gonna keep the list going here. Only 4% of farmland in Sub-Saharan Africa is irrigated. 
So Martin Fisher and Nick Moon's manual irrigation pump has a potential to irrigate 20% of farms, giving sustenance to thousands of families year round all across the globe as well. Now, these examples are certainly not unique. Ali Shahbaz created the iodine coated life saving dot for women with iodine deficiency in India. And Jane Chen and her team in the United States created a $25 baby incubator, and so on. All of us can and do solve problems around us once we are motivated to do so. To kick this off, I want to share a little bit about me. But before that, that is the essence of innovation, right? Brian, Martin, Nick, Ali, and Jane are all change makers, particularly in the sense that their motivation to innovate was driven by this immense urge to help their fellow humans more than anything else out there today. My name is Githanjali Rao. I'm 15 years old and I'm an innovator, author, and promoter of STEM, especially for students and youth, especially with girls as well. I like to talk and write and speak at schools and forums like these to help socialize the importance of using science and technology almost like a catalyst for social change in our communities every single day. And more than that, sharing the message that anyone can be an innovator out there. Today, I'd like to talk about innovation, but more importantly, I'd like to think about the process of, or I'd like to talk about the process of thinking differently. And I'd also like to talk about an approach towards innovation, ideation, and problem solving that has worked for me and many I know by simplifying down the process. And in addition to that, I wanna discuss our emerging world and how technology is growing on a daily basis and use this opportunity to talk about the role of all of us in encouraging more students to be involved in the workforce, especially within scientific research and engineering. So hopefully you're able to take a little something away from our time here together. But let's kick this off with sharing how important innovation and the impact on our community is. A sustainable world is more than the environment that we live in and the planet we need to protect. I know that the Royal Academy of Engineering inspires the next generation of scientists and engineers to make a positive impact for a sustainable world. But more than that, it's about the people, all of us who live in this world and need to survive and thrive. Whether we like it or not, all of us do coexist on this planet and have to deal with challenges together. And if nothing else, the pandemic has been a great equalizer and has hopefully made all of us think about sustaining ourselves. Our evolution is to find newer ways to solve problems around us as responsible custodians of the planet for future generations. And this is where innovation plays a huge role. Solving new problems with old ways is a futile effort. And all of us do play a crucial role in innovation and the quest for finding solutions to problems that affect all of us helps develop a prosperous world that we can all grow up in together. We see problems and challenges that have worsened with time such as pollution of our resources. And we were talking about climate change earlier, but we also see problems that have never existed before, like cyberbullying. And all these new tools make our lives easier, but they open up avenues to create new social problems, new diseases, loss of personal privacy, depletion of natural resources, misinformation, lack of authoritative sources, illiteracy, global income disparity. And I could keep the list going. But those are some of the growing challenges affecting our lives, and we have the potential to derail them as well. Now, I think it's important to state that we're living in interesting times where newer technologies are shaping our future every single day. But more than that, they offer us opportunities for innovation like never seen before. Let's kick it off with 5G wireless tech. It's already here. A 20 gig per sec 5G speed offers near real-time interaction with almost no lag. Think about it this way. Surgeries can be performed from remote or people can be in video conferences as holograms. Nanotechnology. It allows the development of robots that are smaller than viruses and can even cure diseases. Now the last century was about machines performing repetitive tasks, but AI now allows machines to think and decide just like human beings. Imagine everyday decisions that require human capacity and experience to determine the best options will soon be replaced by robotic intelligence that learns from our history and provides us the best recommendations going forward as well. And we've all heard of self-driving cars and autonomous vehicles, but with the advent of the internet of things, 
everything will soon be talking to everything else on ultra fast networks and making intelligent decisions as it goes along. So what I'm trying to say here is that this opportunity subjects that have been brought to the playing field is changing our lives. Biomedical research works best when chemists, engineers, and biologists work together with a common goal and purpose. Innovative synthetic techniques provide novel drug discovery models and provide the opportunity to develop unique clinical tools to study cellular processes. In today's world, it's difficult to find any aspect of everyday life that isn't directly or even indirectly affected by information technology. However, to drive a new generation of innovators who are inspired to develop ideas, more work has to go into spreading awareness of the remarkable success in all the fields that we see. I started early on with this belief that modern problems require a more interdisciplinary approach to solution development. And most of my solutions are at an intersection of biology, chemistry, computing, engineering, again, can keep the list going. In other words, not only are many emerging technologies powerful by themselves, but increasingly they're coming together to develop solutions we couldn't conceive just a generation ago. As Peter Diamandis, one of my favorite motivational speakers and technology authors calls the power of convergence, right? Think about a future where there are AI processing chips, nanomaterial based medical devices, and etc. The optimism is that all of these technologies when used the right way, free us from the mundane and allow us to focus on solving hard problems with frankly hard solutions as well. However, as fascinating as the future looks and all the choices that we have, I'm actually here to talk about something more basic. I want to talk about the importance of taking simple steps in our daily lives to recognize and empathize with the problems around us and try to solve them through interesting yet simple ideas. And now how we can look at it is innovation in our daily lives, possibly using the latest technology, but actually most times using whatever is available right in front of us. Now, in my opinion, the future of innovation isn't a vague idea, but instead it's a consequence of collective empathy for each other's concerns and the will to solve them. Tools, technologies, and techniques are only as good as the intention to solve the problem as whole. Innovation has to become a citizen movement and should be a part of the early education and school curriculums as well. And K through 12 education should start to explicitly teach ideation and problem solving to current or imagined problems. Failure should be an acceptable consequence of innovation and shouldn't be stigmatized and should be expected as a part of the learning process. That's the starting point. And teenagers who are unencumbered by these so-called practical constraints of the world can develop solutions that expensive research organizations might not be able to. To cultivate and encourage innovation in youth, additional support and investment is needed in grants, recognition, and resources such as laboratories as well. Innovation is not an option for us anymore, and it's certainly not limited to professional adults in the industry and academia. The challenges of today and tomorrow will need all of us, including innovation as a part of the early education and empathy to understand the challenges that we all face together. Those are the first steps. Those are the ones that we should start to tackle as well. Now, I've talked about this pretty broadly, but in my case, my journey of innovation has been about looking at problems around me and trying to come up with simple yet exciting solutions. Some of my early solutions were a snake bite diagnostic tool built on non-contact thermography technology. I also created this pollen repellent because of my pollen allergies based on electrostatic ions, a black box finder for airplanes built on underwater laser communication, and a laser protection screen on airplane windshields, which is built on rubidium atoms bound together. So this encouraged me to work on some bigger and more complex problems in our community. And I started to look at some solutions for some more serious problems like lead contamination. And I tried to apply these technologies the best that I could to the world around us. For example, Tethys, my lead detection device, uses carbon nanotube technology, which is one of the most powerful technologies out there today. Basically, the Tethys test strip is built with carbon nanotubes doped with chloride ions. 
and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But about six years ago, I learned about the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. And I couldn't accept the fact that there was a city in our country where thousands of children my age were exposed to a poison every single day that caused lifelong damage to their mental capacity, their vital organs, and even their normal growth, all just because they were drinking water in their daily lives. And app appallingly, this issue isn't just in Flint. It's a worldwide problem, and I recognize that we have to do something about it. So this became the inspiration for me to develop a quick and accurate tool to detect for lead contamination in water. I called it Tethys after the Greek goddess of fresh water. It uses carbon nanotubes doped with chloride ion to detect the lead in the water. And to make the test more user-friendly, it provides real-time results within seconds on a mobile phone that anybody can read out and anyone can understand as well. The disposable sensor cartridge in Tethys includes nanotubes with the chloride ions. And let's say I were to dip it into water with lead. When the, when the cartridge is dipped, the lead in the water, assuming that the water was lead contaminated, binds with the chloride ions, forming molecules of lead chloride, which then increases the amount of resistance to the flow of current and decreases the conductivity. I'm measuring the change in resistance using the processor and sending all the data to your mobile phone in the custom Tethys app as well. And that's just a starting point. Recently, Tethys has been patented, and I'm excited to continue the journey from here. I've been working on another solution for early directional diagnosis of prescription opioid addiction called Epioni, which is another huge problem we face today with 70,000 deaths and $500 million in economic cost every year. And my solution needs the latest developments in genomics and genetic engineering to identify and detect protein expressed by the mu opioid receptor OPRM1 human gene that indicates addictive behavior. Called Epioni after the Greek goddess of soothing of pain, the detection itself uses a standard immunological method, but I actually built a portable device to make the process much easier and much faster as well. Now, in addition to that, that is the first ever tool that is still a prototype, but also first ever tool to clinically diagnose for addiction. Next, I recently launched an artificial intelligence solution to detect and prevent cyberbullying called Kindly. At its core, it is a service available as an API call for anyone building a mobile app or a web solution to add a cyberbullying filter capability. It's a supervised learning solution that adapts to the change in trends, slangs, memes, and emojis. And it comes with a sample chat mobile app and a Chrome plugin, but can also be invoked via SMS and other social media platforms. Using timely user feedback and prompts, the solution isn't meant to be punitive, but instead a way for individuals to learn and amend their bullying actions when communicating with others. And while this seems to be a technological solution, the brain chemicals and the brain chemistry that allows a teenage brain to take impulsive decisions can be altered. And that's really what Kindly aims to do. Just yesterday, I'm excited to share that UNICEF has developed it further, and we're at a stage to start integrating it with other partner platforms as well. So I'm excited to see where that takes Kindly as a whole. Now my current work. 748,000 cases of cryptosporidiosis occurs each year in the United States alone due to a lack of clean drinking water. Current detection methods are based on molecular lab tests, such as PCR examinations that require expensive equipment and more importantly, are time consuming. I started to ask myself if I can develop a cheap, natural bioelectric sensor built with a genetically engineered microbe and then cause the microbe to trigger a bioremediation pathway to signal the presence of DNA in a source of drinking water. So basically what that means is I should then be able to detect that electrical impulse change using a biotransducer. So overall, I'm looking to make detection time effective and efficient by creating an electrical sensor, which is able to measure any sort of electricity value that comes from a biological input as well, which is a pretty complex concept, but it's very interesting since it's a growing concept. Again, if you notice the solutions are an interdisciplinary approach with the chemistry of how parasites and its genetic composition reacts. But enough about me. When I talk to others about my ideas, a question I commonly get is how do I do it and where do I start? And I know that is a very, very broad question. And I do realize that it's easy to get stuck in abstract terminologies and process definitions and frankly buzzwords, which we'll talk about in a sec. But trust me, I went through the same experience early on. So I want to share something a lot simpler and that worked for me with all of you. 
But before we get into that, I want to share this concept that I'm sure all of you have heard of, design thinking, right? Again, a buzzword that we've all started to hear again and again. The traditional idea of linear problem solving is increasingly giving way to an alternate approach of design thinking that's more focused on the impact to the end users. Instead of narrowing down choices, exploring new choices first. Instead of solving every single problem by breaking it down and analyzing it, we can try to put combinations together, getting comfortable with beta versions, iterating through prototypes and learning from failure. As Tim Brown calls from consumption to participatory systems, right? Where this producer consumer relationship is actually changing to more of this collaborative development of solutions as well that benefit both sides. Now design has down the years for some reason focused on the little things, right? And not in the best way possible, beveled edges, cool interfaces, Bluetooth connections. Again, can keep the list going, but that's all great. But really what design needs to focus on is it needs to solve some of the biggest problems we see today, like climate change, pollution, privacy, pandemics, and so on. My solution is essentially a simplified step towards that goal. Now let's kick this off with my five-step process. Here's my process of innovation just in five steps from concept to socializing. Observe, brainstorm, research, build, and communicate. Each step of the process has its own significance towards coming up with a solution. And each of the you know, steps have detailed sub-steps and techniques, which I cover in my workshops as well as in my book, but today we'll cover them at a high level. So let's start this off with observe. Pay attention to things around you and try to identify simple problems that have been discussed before you or are obvious to you or the customers that you serve. The biggest thing about observing is it needs to be a gut feeling. It needs to be something you connect with. Brainstorm. Quantity over quality is key in this step. Write down all the ideas possible to solve the identified problem, and you'll be able to narrow this down in the next step, which brings us to three, research. I spend some time on the computer, books, and other materials to look for resources that are in the area of relevance to the problem as well as potential solutions as well. Attempt to narrow down your ideas into one primary likely solution that you'd like to stick with. And build. Take some time to ideate, sketch, or build what exactly this vision of yours might look like. I always like to say it's better to do this earlier than later since it allows you to visualize your work, even if your work is in progress. And last but not least, the most important step in my opinion, communicate. There's no point in doing something without telling people why you did it. It's always important to tell others about your work so that you spread awareness on the problem you're solving and you tell people what you've done to tackle it. Now, saying all of that, the involvement of everyone, no matter their age, where they are, or the skill sets that they have, coming up with solutions to tackle some of the biggest problems in society is more important than ever. And that's exactly why it's not as linear as it looks. I added a couple more arrows since you make innovation what you want it to be. Our generation is growing up in a place where we're seeing problems that have never existed before. Many are raising their voices, but there's a need for everyone to use their hands to build and suggest ideas that impact the future and the community at large. We're looking for a sustainable world, one that everyone wants to live in. And we, the youth, play a huge role in that as well. Now, I wanna share a statistic that all of you might not have been, you know, or might not have been introduced to since I wasn't. In the coming years and beyond, we need to alleviate problems of availability of educational resources around the world especially in economically disadvantaged countries. And this is the shocking part. About 258 million children and youth worldwide don't have access to education, irrespective of the pandemic, putting them in real danger of being left behind and limiting their opportunities for the rest of their lives. It's a technology problem. It's a privilege problem. It's a geography problem. But saying all of that, it's needless to say an urgent problem but we can start small and start somewhere. And the good news is that we have the technology to support it. We have the technology to make a difference. To tackle this issue, we must invest in opening up the ways in which we connect with students across the world. Many of the common problems in mass education today revolves around lack of infrastructure, inability to physically go into a school building, and shortage of teachers. But all of this can be eliminated through the word that 
all of us have learned to hate, remote teaching. Right in a student's home with the option to learn anytime, anywhere. We've only seen the bad of it. We've only seen the outcome of a pandemic, but we're already being forced to innovate because of COVID-19. But what we're not seeing is that with the leaps we've made in wireless network bandwidth and 5G and faster protocols in the future, it's possible to provide accessible quality education learning to anyone, anywhere, through virtual learning. Just like food, water, and shelter, the internet should be a basic right for every individual in the future. Basic computing devices similar to Raspberry Pis and other shared computing resources can be inexpensive devices to access the internet as a whole as well. And using free collaboration tools, students of all ages can have a collective learning experience across nations and boundaries, like never expected before. Now, we talked a lot about science. We talked a lot about availability of resources. We talked a lot about processes, but I believe awareness goes hand in hand. I bring awareness to all of these problems and have partnered with global organizations to conduct innovation workshops for school students. I'm also working towards incorporating innovation into the curriculum of schools in our area. People like me can always use help from organizations and universities to spread the message using their global outreach as well. Now, in addition to that, I want to share that I am incredibly fortunate to have some mentors who have believed in me, who have inspired me, and mentors whom I've learned everything I know from and will continue to learn from. From personal experience, I can tell you right now that that concept of mentorship is absolutely life-changing, especially as a student. And a lot of my work has been successful due to the active support by the industry and investors with things like internships and research, right? Organizations such as yourself, the University of Colorado Denver, UNICEF, and Denver Water, to name a few, have provided their facilities, their time, their audiences, their funds, and their technologies that I normally wouldn't have access to. And they've allowed me to fail, which has essentially allowed me to stay with the problem longer, which is a cliche thing to say, but it's very, very true. Now, if I had to make one request to all of you, it would be to support folks like me through sponsorships, internships, mentorships, and even friendships. Youth do have the power to change the future, to create a sustainable world and environment. And my challenge to you is to say yes. If a student asks to work with you for a particular product idea, say yes. If a student has a question for you, say yes. Your support does make a difference, and I can say that from personal experience as well. I believe that along with the technology and innovation that we see out there, kids can influence lawmakers and policies to bring about a change. And I've seen that happen firsthand. And just like you're listening to me in your own organizations, you can include even more youth to drive your mission, carry your mission of sustainability, and more importantly, open up from internships, including providing a space for research for school students who might want to go into a field that you were involved in. Now, looking back at my journey, it's been a fun ride and opened my eyes to many new truths. And I always felt that recognitions came with responsibility. And I always like to share this, right? Our society is quick to create stereotypes and decide which jobs are for whom based on who the individual is. It's the 21st century and we're still talking about girls and women struggling to get an education and being part of the science and technical job force and fighting for pay equality. And my generation is inheriting problems that will need each and every one of us to take action and solve. And I hope by being here, I'm representing everyone from every walk of life to share that we can do it too. We see people around us and decide that a job isn't for us or we can't do it. But you make that choice for yourself and be what you want to succeed and help others. And yes, there will be failures and obstacles. But frankly, I'm proud to say that I've failed more times than I've succeeded. And while the world sees the recognitions, every student, every change maker, and every individual has their own ups and downs. So it's okay. It's a natural part of the process. Thankfully, diversity, equity, and inclusivity are becoming part of the corporate missions of many organizations. All organizations can ensure that diversity and inclusivity is part of what you do because no one group is going to bring about a change and it will need all of us going forward from here. And it's a very achievable mission as a whole. Now, to me, success is making a difference in one other person by our actions, right? I always like to share five key takeaways from at the end of our conversation today. Now, they are, first, 
aspire to be a lifelong learner, right? Never stop being a student. The more we learn, the better we become as individuals and just as a productive member of our community as well. It's always important to keep learning. Secondly, understand that innovation, ideation, and most importantly, creativity cannot work on a deadline. It needs time and nurturing. And more than that, it should feel like something you're choosing to do. Third, find mentors, preferably several of them. A good mentor helps us stay focused, improve our skills, and build our network going forward as well. Fourth, don't be afraid to ask questions, right? Asking more questions can make a crucial difference in your success. And last but not least, have a problem-solving mindset. Recognize what needs to be done and find creative but practical solutions and then take action. We cannot just limit ourselves to the solutions of today. We're offered this unique opportunity to think bigger and solve bigger problems. Science and technology will be required as mandatory to solve health, climate change, manufacturing, and biotech in the future. We're all living in this world to make a difference. And with the right support and encouragement, I know that many of us would be inspired to take up the challenge and help alleviate problems in society and protect the environment that we live in because each and every one of us can make change. Thank you so much for your time and I'll hand it back over. So thank you so much, Gitanjali. That was both inspiring and enlightening. And if you'll allow me, I have uh, a couple of questions for you, please. Firstly, what impact do you think that the greater empowerment of young people in order to have their voice heard on important issues will have on the world's ability to solve wicked problems such as climate change? Great question. And I think the biggest thing here is that we're not taking into consideration the amount of students who are out there who are coming up with solutions. Most times than not, and whether we deny it or not, students are looked at as a nuisance, right? Something that are in the way. And kids are looked at as someone who may not be as mature. And really what I'm here to say is that while that may be true, it's a different perspective. And sometimes a different perspective is needed to solve problems of the future. Just like I said during my talk, we're living in these times where we're facing these problems firsthand. And now more than ever, it's important for everyone to want to get up and take action, including kids. So that's why I'm a strong believer that we should support students' journeys as well and allow students to also come up with ideas and just give them a chance. Because who knows, maybe one day they'll create a life-changing invention to solve the world's problems, just like climate change. Thank you so much. And uh, if we had many students like you, Katangeli, I think we'd be solving lots of problems very quickly. My next question. What is the biggest opportunity for positive change that you see for the future? And what are you most excited about? I think the biggest opportunity um, relies based on what we have done during the pandemic. We made jumps in healthcare, communication, businesses like never seen before. And it's unfortunate that we need to have a pandemic to stray us away from the normal. However, what it's done is it's opened up more opportunities. And that's really where this concept of virtual comes from, right? It provides a lot more opportunities for not only jobs and occupations, but also a lot more opportunities to conserve the planet for the future. And I'm really hoping to see that the biggest changes that we see, the best things that we see going forward are going to be involved in our education system. At one point, each and every student across the world will have a strong enough education to you know, maintain what they're passionate about and hopefully all be in the workforce one day. And I think my hope for the future is that each and every person um, is maintains a quite literally a sustainable way of living, right? That sustainable world has, word has been shot around for so long, right? We keep talking about making a sustainable world. And I think really what's going to make that happen is one, the perspective of everyone and two, taking advantage of our technologies out there. And I'm really excited to see how, you know, the world decides to do that. Thank you for that. And the, the last one from me, what can we, as established engineers in industry and academia, do to help your generation innovate to solve the problems of the future? I think that the role of adults um, is strongly, the, the role of adults is looked at in a very um, crucial manner, right? And I think really what it is, is what changes everyone is a sense of belief. 
a lot of times the reason why students aren't involved in this is because they don't have the resources to be able to help them take their ideas forward. And secondly, they don't have that belief firsthand. And they have this sense of self-doubt pouring over them. I can tell you from personal experience, out of the hundreds, two hundreds of people that I've emailed and asked for access to a lab, maybe one person said yes. And even though so many people shot me down for my age, my gender, my race, the couple people who said yes brought me up. And I think that's the role of adults, just support, right? Being willing to say yes to a student once in a while, helping them find their passion and just supporting them in ways possible. That's really what got me involved in innovation and um, me involved in doing what I love to do. And I hope to see a lot more students finding their passion the same way. A great response. And uh, just say yes is a very big message for us all to take away. Thank you. Let me conclude by, first of all, thanking you sincerely for a wonderful presentation, uh, Gitanjali. You've, you've joined us tonight. Uh, the, uh, we could have gone on talking for many hours listening to you. It's been a really inspiring and a fascinating exchange with you. When you visited the Global Grand Challenges Summit, you quoted Marie Curie. And well, tonight you have truly lived up to her words. We understand more about your work and your motivation. And I think we will all fear less for the future, knowing that you and your contemporaries are as committed to responsible innovation as we are here. So thank you also to everyone for joining us uh, for this excellent event. Uh, we do hope to see you all more directly here at uh, Prince Philip House and the Academy's events uh, again very soon. So thank you once again, and let's conclude by giving our special guest a big round of applause.